So I want to start today's episode by sharing uh, some quotes, a kind of a string of quotes from Anson Dorrance's book, Training Soccer Champions. Some coaches are no longer willing to make the emotional commitment needed to motivate players to attain the standard required of them to compete successfully at the highest level. Coaches sometimes are not willing to make that commitment because it's so exhausting. I think what happens to great coaches who are not as effective at the end of their career is they lose their willingness to take the required stress and emotional confrontation that they did when they were younger. Well, I believe the high price football and basketball coaches pay is emotional and physical exhaustion from trying to keep themselves and the people in their programs on an impossible cutting edge. To constantly motivate players, you have to be a driving force and make a personal investment for which you can pay dearly. The fight against mediocrity is taxing. It is even more taxing from a leadership perspective where you can't just take care of yourself. You have to inspire the ones around you to follow your example. They are not willing to confront. Coaches are not willing to confront when their players are not exerting maximum effort and achieving maximum performance because it's a stressful, uncomfortable situation. They end up having a practice that is easy to run and fun to coach. They win the popularity contest, but sacrifice respect. And that's the way that lower level coaches lose the respect of their team by not being demanding enough, not harping on a higher standard, and not making the stressful, passionate investment and risk a loss of popularity. The result is standards are lowered. But great coaches are not afraid to tackle emotional situations in order to get players to accept a higher standard. So those thoughts from Anson Dorans in his book, Training Soccer Champions, they're not only relevant to today's episode, but one of the most talked about aspects of coaching in this podcast, the fulfillment and joy of coaching, as well as the burnout that might come with coaching. If I had to sum up my biggest takeaway from my conversation with Anson Dorrance, it is this. Dorrance has been coaching nearly 50 years, and yet he has more enthusiasm and energy for coaching than any coach I have ever met. Coaching doesn't drain him, it energizes him. And the reason for that is because he doesn't sacrifice his principles or values. He coaches the way that he believes is best. He makes hard decisions, he has hard conversations, he has created the program that he would want to play in. And he's not willing to sacrifice his principles and values. When we sacrifice our principles and values because we're worried about a player's fragility, um, an angry parent, or a lack of administrative support for a hard decision that we make, or whatever it is, we don't enjoy it. We don't enjoy coaching in those moments. In many ways, we're miserable. And the more and more we sacrifice what's most important to us, the more we do this, The more worn out we become as a leader, the more taxing the job becomes on us. Anson is a great example on how to run a program. And while you will take a lot from the practical things that he shares on how to build culture, I hope you recognize the most important thing is to remain true to yourself while constantly evolving. In today's episode, we're going to talk about accountability, playing time, valuing every player, helping players get to the truth, and working with parents. After this episode, I'd recommend checking out his books, Training Soccer Champions, The Man Watching, and The Vision of a Champion. Also, you may wanna check out my online courses and spreadsheet on the Competitive Cauldron, the Playing Time System, and the Culture System. All these online courses are built on many of the things that I've learned in my study of Dorrance over the years and my work with coaches. There will be a link in the details of this episode to the Competitive Cauldron and the Playing Time System or you can just head on over to tocculture.com forward slash store. You are listening to the Coaching Culture Podcast. The mission of this podcast is to provide actionable ways for you to grow as a leader and improve your team's culture. For any new listeners, my name is JP Nurbin. I'm the founder of TOC Culture Consulting, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Nate Sanderson. TOC provides one-on-one coaching for leaders, and we teach a framework for building culture. If you want to learn this framework, you can check out my book, The Culture System. It's available at Amazon and on Audible. It's full of practical ways to build your culture, as well as case studies and other unique stories of the ideas put into practice. Now, if you're not a reader or you want to go deeper into the framework and train you and your staff in it, in this leadership and culture framework, then you should check out our incredible online course at tocculture.com. Also at tocculture.com and in the details of this episode, you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter, which gives you the notes to this and every episode 
of the Coaching Culture Podcast, as well as Nate and I share every week some thoughts and strategies on leadership and culture in our weekly article. All right, let's get right into our conversation with Anson Dorrance. The great challenge in these one-on-ones with players is how much truth do we tell? You know, and you seem to have this great gift to be able to balance, to do both truth and love, you know, to to put your arm around them, to speak truth into them, to challenge them, uh, you know, as as human beings, not just as athletes. I'm curious when in those one-on-ones, you know, I, I remember reading that you did them maybe three times a year and you have a file on every player. Um, have you made some changes in how you approach the one-on-ones recently? And, and particularly, how do you address the issue of playing time, which is potentially the biggest divisive issue or talked about thing within team environment, team culture? Playing time is really interest, uh, uh, <clears throat> easy when you've got uh, data. Basically, you kick everyone's rear end and in practice, that gets you in the game. And then once you're in the game, your performance in the game decides whether you get more minutes or less. So it's just not complex. And I think uh, in the coaching profession, we make it too complex. We make it too subjective. And I think if you turn it over to uh, data, um, you make it less subjective. And then uh, the practice data gets you in the game. Your game data keeps you on the court, in your case, or on the field, in my case. And so there shouldn't be this extraordinary complexity. Um, because it's all <laughs> all our sports are ruled by data, especially your sport, by the way. Oh my gosh, the amount of data that uh, you can collect in a basketball uh, uh, game is extraordinary. I mean, soccer, it's a lot harder to extract it. You need these absolute professionals to break down a soccer game just because passing a, a ball forward and keeping possession is more valuable than passing a ball back. But you guys have statistics on everything. I mean, obviously assists, you know, points, uh, shooting percentages, you know, turnovers. I mean, the amount of data in a basketball game is extraordinary. And so a guy that gets into the game, he will know whether or not he sucked, uh, even without the coach telling him. Um, And even though the parent in the stands, you know, think, you know, my, uh, my son should get, you know, a certain number of shots. Well, if he's missing most of them, no then he shouldn't get that number of shots. And so even an absolutely, you know, brain dead father that, you know, is in love with his son or daughter that insists on a certain amount of shots will know that if you're missing, you know, 60% of your two point shots and 70% of your three point shots, no, you shouldn't get that shot. Um, so, you know, it's very easy, you know, if you look at data to sort out, you know, whether or not you should play. And so for us, uh, that's never been an issue. It doesn't mean we've solved the, uh, the parental problems. No, of course not. I mean, these (laughs) parents love their kids. Of course they do. And of course, while they were watching their kids growing up, not only were they playing every minute of every game, but they were the best player, not just in the game, but probably in the state in my case, or the region, or sometimes nationally. I mean, so these were not ordinary players before they ended up in an environment where other people were as quick and fast and tough and competitive as they were. And then, of course, the dynamic changes. All of a sudden, if you're matched up with someone that's just as athletic as you are, there are other things that sort of come to play. And then can you navigate those? Because when you were beating up on the uh, NARPs, you know, when you were in high school, uh, that's no challenge. I mean, you could roll out of bed and beat them just because you're quicker, faster, stronger than all of them. So yeah, that's not an achievement. Now, when you're matched up with someone that is equally, you know, competitive and fit and strong, there's a different dynamic. And so, uh, <clears throat> this is where, you know, we start to, <laughs> uh, lose the support of the people that think you should play them regardless of how they play it. It's like, I had this one parent that was incredulous, and my wife was with me when this was occurring. This player uh, started in her sophomore year, and the team didn't really do that well. And then in her junior year, I decided to put her more on the bench, and we won the national championship. The day after the national championship, the dad was in my office asking why I didn't play his daughter more. And... uh, I kept saying, well, uh, we tried that the previous year and it just didn't seem to work. And this year we tried something else. And I don't know if you were there yesterday, but we're national champions right now. 
And I kept saying the same thing. And my wife was waiting for me right outside my office. And she was incredulous because she heard me say the same thing like 10 times about why I made the choice. And don't you think the choice was good? We're champions. We're national champions right now. And the dad just still couldn't get over himself and couldn't get over the fact I didn't play his daughter. And uh, I kept telling him, well, we tried that last year. We played her maximum minutes and things just didn't work out. We tried someone else this year. Did you see how well this other kid played in your daughter's place? And anyway, so my poor wife is standing out there and she was incredulous. We're going to dinner and she's sitting next to me as we're driving to the restaurant. And she just kept saying, I just can't believe it. You said the same thing, you know, 10 times. And he just didn't want to hear anything you said. I, I said, no, honey, this is, you know, this is the nature of dealing with uh, some parents. They just, you know, and, you know, I understand that they love their kids. They don't want their kids to suffer. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, it's just hard for them. It, it is. And so but, you know, we're not going to genuflect to their pressure. You know, uh, I do this for a living um, and, you know, bless their hearts. They're trying to protect their kids. But no, I'm not going to play her because you think she should play. I'm going to play her because she earned it. And the kid that played in her place, she earned it and she deserves to play. Would you like to chat with her parents about having their uh convince those parents that I should give your daughter the playing time as opposed to theirs when their daughter's kicking everyone's rear end in and yours was not. So how would that conversation go? So anyway, that stuff is, you know, that's why we're, I guess, paid the big bucks as they say. Yeah. Well, let me follow up a little bit on that because I think in a basketball context, you know, thinking about my roster of 15 players, I'm going to play seven regularly eight and nine are going to get some time but when it really comes to crunch time there's going to be the same five right and so even if i'm playing 10 there's five guys that are that are not in the rotation and some of them it's going to be really tough for them to crack through right so i know just from from your stuff and also just knowing some things about dean smith you talked earlier about how you know he treated everybody the same the lowest manager to the star player to michael jordan to the reserve the rotation player and that comes out in a lot of the things that we, you know, see in your background here is that you found a way to, and I don't think manage is the right word, and I don't think handle is the right word, but I know with the coaches that we work with, myself included, it's that middle to the end part of the roster that can be so challenging to to communicate to them that they're still valued and that they still have not I don't know if worth is even the right word, but they're valuable to the team. Obviously, they have worth, but um, how have you approached? that so you go through your data you have your guys that are playing and you have guys that aren't playing and so in terms of just coaching those players what's your approach there that's an excellent question so if you can't figure out a way for the players at the bottom of your roster to know you care about them uh you're in the wrong profession and um, it, it gets back to, you know, the cliche I was using earlier about the higher callings. And again, I I pretend like this is a joke. It's not a joke. You know, I talk all the time about, <clears throat> you know, if I had a choice for you to either win a gold medal in the Olympics or cure cancer, <clears throat> I would select for you to cure cancer. This doesn't have to be your highest calling. Your highest calling is who you are as a human being. So in our program, and uh, we referenced it just a second ago, <clears throat> the top award at our banquet is not MVP. It's the Kelly Muldoon Award for Character. And so you can demonstrate your character on both sides of the playing time divide. Demonstration of character on the I never play side of the playing time divide is actually a demo is the most, I guess the easiest place to demonstrate character because your sacrifice is total. You don't even get to play. You don't even get to travel. And yet you support the team and its mission. That's extraordinary character. And if the team can see that, what they will do in the peer evaluation is they will give that person high marks. 
And we've had a lot of people that finish really high on the character, I guess, ranking, if you will. And by the way, we don't post the character ranking. What we want with characters, we want all of our kids to finish above a 3-0. Four is an extraordinary example of this core value. Three is lives this core value most of the time. Two is uh, <clears throat> sometimes lives this core value. One is rarely lives this core value. So we want all of our kids to basically live above a 3-0 in terms of character. And so if they're doing that, uh, in my opinion, that demonstrates that they fit into our culture. And so a kid that's not playing can demonstrate they have the character to be a part of our mission. And our mission isn't just a, a football one, it's a, uh, it's a human development one. And then there are all sorts of ways that they contribute. We do a lot of community outreach. We do a lot of visits to, uh, uh, we are the, uh, the state hospital for the state of North Carolina. And uh, there are uh, cancer victims in that hospital that need attention. Um, so there are a thousand different ways our kids can demonstrate their value as human beings and go beyond whether or not they're ranked number one in the cauldron. And those uh, people are celebrated. We have 13 different core values. And the top three are highlighted. And if you finish the top three in any core value, you get this wonderful Nike fleece with the symbol of your character on the fleece. And so there are all sorts of ways, even if you're not a very good soccer player, that you're going to be honored in our program for who you are as a human being. And so that's also a very important uh, part. And then uh, there are a thousand different ways you can. Um, share your love for a kid doesn't have to be playing them uh we had a kid that started in uh, 2021 and then last fall in 2022 not only did she not start she rarely played she wrote something on instagram that was stunning it was so powerful because she talked about how this fall was the most enjoyable soccer season of her life and the irony was she started and played maximum minutes the previous year. And that year, this past fall, she hardly played at all. And so we celebrated her character <clears throat> because we want the kids to support the team and its mission, but also to support the kids on the team. And so there are a lot of different ways you can share your love and respect uh, for these kids. And they're dying for it. They're dying to win your love and respect. And if the culture is not structured properly, they measure your love and respect with playing time. If you structure your culture in the right way, they measure it the way it should be measured. Do you care about me? There's so many ways you can share that I do whether or not they play. And uh, I tell this so often, it's almost a cliche in my program. I play some players I don't like very much. They're ass kickers. There's some kids I never play that I love completely. Those kids can feel it. They can feel it. <clears throat> hmm. And uh, <clears throat> we're all human beings. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of ways to communicate that. One of my favorite backhanded compliments of all time is I was speaking uh, to a, a player of mine, and this happens with a lot of our kids that go off to the pro league. And even though I think the American pro league is getting better and better and better, um, if you do any uh, research on what's happened in the last three or four years, we've had all kinds of issues in our pro league. <clears throat> and so uh, when a kid leaves our program and leaves a lot of the top programs and goes in the pro league, uh, the pro experience is actually not as good of an experience as their collegiate one. And so usually when a kid calls me from playing on a pro team, I know they just need some support because they're not enjoying it. And I was talking to this one kid and I have to be careful because I always want to support the professional coach and the environment they're in, because one of the worst things you can do is to do what basically the parents and the high school coaches do for their kids that come into play for me that aren't on the roster. They end up a cabal that sort of 
lets the player know, oh, no, no, they're making a mistake by not playing you. And all of a sudden uh, you create this sort of toxic, you know, circle. Uh, and I didn't want to be a part of a toxic circle for one of my kids that was playing at a pro level. So generally I support the professional coach and the difficulty in the environment they're in. And uh, <clears throat> this one kid was on the phone with me and here's what she said. You know, she said, Anson, when I played for you, I thought I could play for anyone. And that was sort of a, you know, a backhanded compliment because what she was implying is you were so hard on me. I didn't think there was a coach in the world I could play for that would be as hard on me as you were. So, you know, and then she said, but through your criticism, I could feel your love. That meant the world to me um, because she was right. I did love the kid. And was I hard on her? Yep. I was very hard on her because I am the kids I'm hardest on are the ones with the greatest potential. And they seem to think that, you know, I'm just, I'm out to get them and no. And then I'll always mention some player I rarely criticize in practice. And the player knows that, you know, this is a player I rarely criticize. And I say, well, why do you think I criticize you the whole time? And I never criticize her. And of course, she knows immediately that, yeah, that kid uh, is not going to get on the field. But I am. I said, that's right. I criticize you because your potential is off the charts. I don't criticize her because she has maximized her potential. So do you want me to stop saying things to you? Because if I do, what that means is I've given up on your growth. Or do you want me to criticize you for every mistake you make? And then the, invariably they come back to know, please <clears throat> continue to criticize me. Because what they do realize eventually is, yep, the ones I criticize the most are the ones with the most potential. Mm -hmm. But how do I wrap my arms around the kid that never plays? Well, I've got to figure out different ways to do that because I'm not going to play them. I've got two questions before we let you go again. I, I want to be respectful of your time, Coach. Um, but there's one I have to ask, which is something that really helped me change my perspective in coaching. I, I want to, you know, all the coaches that listen here, we want to make a difference in the lives, the players that we coach. We want to help prepare them for the world. Um, and I've had some negative experience, just like every coach out there today with parents. You know, you shared one story there of just the parent that just can't see what we're trying to do. And we can't seem to get through that. But I remember reading your stuff and you, and there's one line in one of your books where you talked about like every weekend was almost parents weekend. Like you, you really tried to bring parents into the program and make them feel a part of what you're doing. Do you continue to do that? And I was just curious if you could kind of share some ways on that, because I think that is really, really important. If we really want to have an impact uh, on an individual's life, like the parent is one of the biggest influences and we probably do need to engage them in some some capacity. So I'm just kind of curious your perspective on that. Yeah. Uh, we've never sort of, you know, held the parents at, at arm's length uh, because the, the way we look at it, the reason their daughters are so good is uh, honestly because of the parents. Certainly in our sport that is an upper middle class sport, the parents have invested in their game. The expense that a soccer player goes through to become elite is extraordinary. They're traveling to tournaments all over the country. Their parents are generally paying for it. And so uh, uh, to some extent, I owe the parent for investing in their kid, which is you know why we've recruited them, why they're, they're with us. Uh, but also, I want the parent to be a part of helping me uh, shape uh, the player in the most positive way. And I know that they're going to be an important resource. So uh, um, I'm always willing to share with the parents anything they want to know. If they want to know practice data, I'm willing to share it with them. And every now and again, I'll ask the kid, do you want me to send your parents the the stuff you know that we're sending out to you guys? Uh, and of course, every player says no. <laughs> Uh, because they would rather write their own, you know, story for their parents. And the last thing they want is to have their story contradicted by the data. So, you know, I get it. Um, so we uh, we do embrace uh, the parents. And honestly, there are a lot of parents I genuinely like. And I'm always impressed with the parents when I bench their kids that I can look at them and tell that uh, they get it. 
they get it. And I always let those parents know that I appreciate their support. Uh, and many of those parents I'm still connected with. Now, some parents, of course, you know, have no understanding of what they're looking at. Um, and, you know, they're going to hate you with a passion for the rest of their lives. My favorite one is I got a text from a mom once that was blaming me <clears throat> for the fact her daughter wasn't any good because I didn't have the capacity to motivate her. In other words, it was my fault that she sucked um, because I wasn't a good enough motivator to get her to the next level. I cherish that text. I look at my phone, you know, uh, regularly uh, just because uh, it's it's this classic thing that uh, I share whenever I, I get a presentation. And uh, this thing I share, I, I stole from a, a colleague of mine at UNC, and this is a sociologist. This is a, a great idea my athletic director came up with. He brought this, the, the resident emeritus sociologist on our campus to tell us, and this was in 2012, who we were coaching. So we could do a better job recruiting them, do a better job coaching them. And this guy was absolutely brilliant. And I can't remember everything he said, but I will never forget the first slide he puts up in his slide deck. And the reason I'll never forget it is the first slide is dated 1969. That was my high school graduation year. This kid is coming home from school and he has all F's on his report card and the parents are screaming at the kid. Then it shifts to the next slide, which was 2012, which was the year when he was giving the lecture. The kid is coming home from school. He has all F's on his report card, and the parents are screaming at the teacher. And I was thinking, bingo. Yep, those are the millennials. Those are the Gen Zs. God forbid it's their kid's fault that they suck. No, it's my fault. Uh, and sure enough, and that's where we are right now. That's where you guys are now as basketball coaches. That's where I am as a soccer coach. If the kid fails, it's not their failure. It's mine. And to some extent, I embrace that, which is why when a kid, you know, uh, in his senior speech or her senior speech, you know, throws everyone in the program under the bus, yeah, we fail. But you know what? Uh, they fail too. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to share the blame on that one. Uh, so, uh, but that's where the culture is right now because of the self-esteem movement, parents are very reluctant, um, to basically criticize their kids in any way. And this has a, a twofold negative effect on the development of their own child. One is if they praise their kids for things that aren't praiseworthy, you know, the old, everyone gets a trophy thing, <clears throat> their kids understanding of standards is going to be absolutely shattered. Because it doesn't matter what they did. Their parents thought it was great and always supported them. And, of course, under the illusion that this is going to create incredible self-esteem in my kid. And no, no, no. All it does is it certainly ruins their sense of standards. But the other thing it ruins is their respect for authority. Because eventually a kid knows their parents are full of crap. And so they now have no respect for their parents because their parents praise them for everything. Now they enter the real world. And what's their first taste of the real world? Me. I'm the real world. I am data driven. So guess what? To get on the field, you got to play. You got to win. You got to dominate. You got to demonstrate that I have to have a reason to play you. I'm not going to put you on the field just because your parents think you're the you know best thing since sliced bread. No, you've got to prove yourself in practice. And all of a sudden, reality hits. Oh, my gosh. And so now, of course, they're commiser commiserating with their parents. When they call their parents after the first two or three days of preseason, this is not what they're saying. They're not saying, oh, my gosh, mom and dad, boy, was my ass handed to me today. I can't believe it. Everyone in the field just destroyed me. That's not what they're saying. They're basically protecting themselves because they know in their parents' eyes, they're extraordinary. They're going to preserve that myth as long as possible. And so, no, they're not telling them the truth. And so it's really interesting. Whenever I make a presentation to a, a, a business, I talk about three things that have uh, separated our success at the University of North Carolina, also when I was coaching the national team. And they are sort of in this order. I think the most critical thing is character. So we consider that a priority. The second most uh, critical thing in my environment is your academic success, because after all, 
I work for an elite institution academically, so I'm going to always represent them. And the final piece is my job is to get their personal narrative to the truth as fast as possible. How do I do that? I do that with data. I do that with data. And so almost everyone's personal narrative is designed to protect them from pain and accountability. So most kids that come in are laced with excuses for why they're not fit or why they're not this or why they're not that. My most uh, famous current one is this family has a doctor testify <clears throat> to the fact that one of my kids can play 90 minutes, but she can't pass a beep test because the requirements in the beep test are too challenging for her unique lung disorder. So this is a parent conspiring with the family doctor to convince me, yeah, you can play her for 90 minutes, but she can't pass any of your fitness tests. And so it's just sort of classic, you know, um, radical parentism. And so what's my job? My job isn't to deal with the parent. My job is to sit down with the kid and say, you know what? Um, I think you're better than this. I think we can get you fit. I think we can do this. I think we can do that. Do you agree? And then what you're hoping the kid says is, yeah, I agree. Let's go there. All right, let's go there together. I'll help you. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that word accountability that my one of my, probably my favorite chapter in training soccer champions, which I think is timeless, is greater expectations. And you talk all about how the fight against mediocrity is taxing on coaches and accountability, you know, holding your players to that standard is one of the hardest things. How have you been able to consistently do that over 50 years, almost 50 years of coaching, you know, to be able to continue to challenge your players when probably the resistance is even greater than it's ever been before to that challenge, to that accountability. Well, I'm going to recommend another book. In fact, you reminded me of the book. It's a book by William Damon. I think he's a sociologist at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And he wrote a book. And the reason I'm bringing it up is you reminded me of it. The title of the book is Greater Expectations. And that chapter, in my opinion, <clears throat> are the ideas I stole from his book. Because his book is about the self-esteem movement. His book is about the fact that the way we're raising our kids now is we're lowering their standards. Uh, his book is about all those different issues. So what I would recommend... Um, in fact, I might even reread it myself because I've forgotten a lot of the elements in it, and I think I need to revisit it. But because I named a chapter in that book after it, I guess I must have read that book in the late 80s, early 90s, because it still resonates with me that this is my moral imperative when I'm taking a player to her potential, is to remember that uh, um, she's been raised in a way that uh, has protected her from the truth. I am going to help her get to the truth. And I'm going to try to do it in a loving way. But I'm going to get her there as fast as possible. Because if you're laced with excuses for all of your failures, you're not going to change. But as soon as you take responsibility for every one of your lack of successes, you're going to be able to do something about it. So what's your job and my job? It's to get them to the truth as fast as possible. And as soon as they're there, they're in a position to change their lives. But as soon as their excuses dominate the conversation and protect them from the reality that there's something they could change to make things better, um, they're never going to get better. So I think that's one of our most important jobs. Mm. You've got that learner's mindset. This is my last question for you, because uh, I know you've got other things to be doing here. But is uh... Really, you've been in it almost 50 years. Coaches are leaving the profession at an alarming rate. You seem to have a level of conviction and vitality and enthusiasm and passion for coaching that's almost unmatched to most people I talk to in coaching. And you've been doing this longer than anybody else. What has kept you grounded and moving forward and kept you alive? You know, what is that? Is it a personal discipline within your life? Is it something you do to, you know, pull away from coaching, you know, what has kept you going all these years? I just, I guess I love every aspect of it. I love the competition. I love seeing if we're doing things the right way. 
I love the challenges from my exceptional colleagues that make it hard for us to win, to see if we can still figure out ways to win. Um, I, I love that challenge, but I also genuinely, uh, and you reference this, um, there's so much we can learn out there to make ourselves better. I'm teaching a class right now. The class is the art and science of expertise. Why am I teaching this class? Because I want to learn more about becoming an expert so I can teach it better. And so I am teaching this class not so much for the students to learn stuff. I am teaching the class to listen to my colleagues that are co-teaching it with me to help me become more of an expert in what I'm doing. So I think, yeah, being a lifetime learner uh, is is critical. Uh, and then uh, I genuinely like hanging out with the kids. Uh, and maybe even solving uh, something in a different way. Uh, because maybe the stuff I've been doing in this area wasn't as successful. So maybe I can tweak this. Um, there's a woman that was a, a management professor at Georgetown that uh, I think I was on a panel with her on a, a podcast or something. It had something to do with a podcast. And I connected with this extraordinary woman because of a podcast. And now she's figuring out a way to basically start working for the University of North Carolina, our Keenan Flagler Business School. And we're going to write a book on culture together. And my connection with her was because of a conversation we had after a podcast. I don't know if I was on it or if she and I were on it together, <clears throat> but uh, she is helping me become much more effective. Um, and a part of it is she's taking all of her incredible experiences as an academic and she's pouring it into my sort of, I guess, experiment with the human spirit, which is another way I look at my own program. Um, and we're trying things that are working and I really, really like it. So I want to, you know, hang in there because I've got some ideas that I think are also going to impact on helping us get better. And so I'm intrigued to sort of finish this experiment to see how much better we can get at helping these kids get to the promised land. So for me, uh, it's endlessly fascinating. Um, and, uh, I enjoy every day of it, honestly. I you got me intrigued. I have to ask what's you know, those new things that you've been trying, what's most exciting for you that's been super effective as of late? I'm one of these people that are skeptical about the capacity to teach leadership. <clears throat> and I talk about this all the time, um, um, more in podcasts than when I'm actually at a leadership conference, because I don't believe you can teach leadership. I think you can give someone a chance to lead uh, and then they can demonstrate their leadership capabilities. Uh, but I don't think you can transform someone that's not a leader into a leader. And I think you can change people to a degree, but not to any major degree. And I would love to believe that uh, I can teach leadership because the proof of that would be I try to teach it every spring. And uh, I think I basically fail every spring. Uh, now, um, you know, I do my best, but I've got some new ideas now I'm experimenting with. And actually what I'm having uh, us do in this new leadership space, <clears throat> well, not new leadership space, what I'm doing in my new leadership space is I'm trying to get <clears throat> my top mentors in character to elevate my bottom achievers in character. I'm assigning them one-to-one -one, and we're going to experiment with this. And I'm going to use uh, the woman that I'm going to write the, the, the book with, Chris Porath's book, and it's a great book about community. And we're going to use uh, three chapters out of our book that the mentors are going to read and uh, three chapters that the mentees are going to read. There's an overlap of two chapters, but the mentors are going to read one about radical candor uh, to help them with this leadership quest where they're going to try to transform uh, the uh, character of the mentees. And the mentees are going to read uh, getting uh, a chapter more or less about getting your personal narrative to the truth, but it's it's titled differently. And right now I can't remember the title of that chapter. But basically, <clears throat> we're going to see if we can transform these kids because I love these kids. And uh, 
I was no angel, you know, growing up. So it's not like I sit in judgment of the kids that, you know, aren't at the top range of, you know, their peer evaluations. Um, so uh, I want these kids, I want every one of these kids to thrive and succeed. And so this is a new experiment. Um, and you can check with me in a year and I'll tell you whether or not uh, I have succeeded. But basically, it's sort of funny when anyone who asked me to teach leadership, I said, OK, you know, listen, I'm going to cash the check. But let me tell you this. <clears throat> if someone in your leadership conference says, hey, coach, do you think you can teach leadership? What I'm going to say is no. So am I going to cash your check for teaching leadership? Yes. But I want you to know, I don't believe I can. Uh, but, you know, thanks for the check. You know, you know, we'll put it towards the yacht. Um, <laughs> I don't own a yacht. Uh, but anyway, so uh, uh, but the thing, the reason I never turned down a chance to go to a leadership conference and speak there. I'm trying to learn how to teach leadership. And I just think I've consistently failed. Um, and maybe my standards for teaching leadership are higher than anyone else's. And maybe uh, I'm doing it to the degree that other people think they're doing it. And maybe I don't think that degree is at a higher enough standard, because if <clears throat> if I could teach leadership, then everyone in my program would become a leader. And it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Now, I can play the games that some you know leadership conferences have about leading by example and creating so many leadership categories that I've included my entire roster. But I think that's phony. Um, and I just, you know, I can't lie to myself, uh, the way I think so many of us have to do in order to create the illusion of teaching leadership. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, check with me next year and I'll say, oh, yep. Failed again. Failed again. I'll you send know? you an article from Deborah Rollins is her name. She wrote an article in the Harvard business review, uh, about why leadership de development fails. It's a fascinating article that I read four years ago that really sparked me and our work with coaches to go based on what her research and a lot of the research they've had is that it has to be through experiential learning and mentoring and coaching. So I think you're on the right path, Anson, uh, based upon our experience. Uh, you know, we do a little bit of a leadership council type group type thing where they have groups to mentor pods, units of three athletes that they have to, and they have to work with those basically on an individual basis based upon the needs of that athlete. And, and I talk about it in, in my book. Um, but yeah, I think you're onto something there. I, I, I fully resonate with that. I always give people the analogy that you're not going to become stronger physically teaching people in a classroom, how to become stronger, <laughs> you know, like they have to go and go through the reps. They have to fail. They have to have that experience and, and coaching through that to, to then actually grow stronger in that, you know, and I think it's the same for character, right? Like we can't teach character in a classroom. You know, this is an area that I just think if we could do that sort of stuff, holy cow, uh, do we change the world in the most positive way? So I want to believe that uh, it can be taught. And maybe I just can't teach it. So maybe uh, there are other people out there that are just better at it. Uh, so yeah, I want to get better at it. I know you've got a lot of stuff out there like podcasts that you, your own podcast, I believe, and some other stuff that, you know, coaches should check out to learn more about your stuff and, and the work that you do. Um, what are some of the best ways for people to, or what, where, where should they follow you? Or, or I, I don't, I don't know if you, I, I doubt you manage a social media account, but you know, where, where should they engage with your content? Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. I, we've got three books out there and you mentioned a couple of them. Uh, and it's so interesting that the training soccer champions is still uh, selling at a very rapid rate. Um, and that's the core of, uh, and you mentioned it, the uh, competitive cauldron chapter, the greater expectations chapters, those things still have uh, resonance. And so if you're a coach, that should certainly be something you read. If you want to sort of dig into culture, uh, Tim Carruthers' book, The Man Watching, is the best uh, book about uh, uh, our culture. 
And then uh, we wrote a book for players. Uh, Training Soccer Champion is for coaches. Um, we wrote a book for players. But after I went through it again, it's actually very good for coaches as well. And that's Vision of a Champion. So that's uh, another uh, book uh, that a player can certainly read. Uh, but also I think it would have some value for coaches. There's a podcast attached to a uh, vision of a champion. And so you could listen to uh, Crystal Dunn and Tobin Heath and Serena Vegman, the new English uh, national team coach and Lucy bronze who plays for England and Mia Hamm and Christine Lilly and, you know, all the uh, UNC greats. <clears throat> We've taken a chapter in uh, each chapter in that book and attached an extraordinary personality to it. So <clears throat> a lot of my campers that uh, uh, read the book and listen to podcasts have gotten value out of that. So that might be something as well. So the vision of a champion podcast, which is attached to each chapter chapter of the vision of a champion books. Uh, so those are the primary things. And obviously for a player that's interested in having us look at or our camps are, uh, something where obviously we uh, recruit from. So those would probably be uh, our primary uh, uh, avenues to what you, we do. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't live on social media. Thank the Lord. Um, <laughs> oh, you won't find me on there. We do have someone that runs our social media account. Trust me, it's not me. There are people that pretend they're me <laughs> on social media, but trust me, it's not. So if you get insulted by someone that's pretending to be, be on me on social media, it wasn't me. Uh, so please don't, you know, a firestorm my house. You know, that was not me. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> that should that's do great. it. Thanks so much for the conversation today, Anson. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, that's it for our conversation with Anson. Um, so many takeaways in, in this episode. Uh, one of the first things that really struck me was the highest award in this program is for character. It's not for winning the cauldron. So we've had a lot of talk about this competitive cauldron, but yet at the end of the day, uh, at that awards ceremony, end of year ceremony, the highest award is the award for character. And I love how he emphasizes how not playing is the best way, the simplest way, the easiest way to demonstrate your character. And that's a great challenge to our players to remind them of that. Uh, he got a little bit deeper into the uh, peer assessment where they're ranking players on character of their 13 core values. 13 is a lot of core values. I usually don't recommend 13 core values, but he's been able to develop them over a long period of time. Uh, but it was cool to see the rankings are a one, two, three, or four. I like that rather than one to five because I think sometimes when we go one to five, sometimes the the auto default answer is the three, the less offensive <laughs> rating. But four is an extraordinary example. Three is lives out the core value all the time. Two is sometimes lives it. One is rarely lives this core value. So it might be worth trying to implement that within your own team, especially if you have core values. If you don't have core values, that is done in module three of the Culture System Online course. Um, I love how you know it comes back to as well his mission. Everybody understands the, the mission of the program is about human development, right? It reminds me of Dave Brandt and you know how clear he is with every player about this isn't just about winning national championships. And, and Dave Brandt was Messiah men's soccer coach and he won uh, quite a lot of national championships as well. Um, there's a lot of obviously similarities between Brandt and Dorrance. Um, I also thought it was cool that they're looking for new ways to emphasize core values. So the top three players in each core value get this you know, they have this fleece jumper and they get this emblem uh, for, that are, is connected to the core value. There's a program I work with in Canada, uh, Prairie Hockey Academy. And one thing that they started doing this year was they took their core values and every two weeks, they, a player uh, on the team, a coach, or a teacher in the school could nominate a player for having demonstrated that core value. So they don't just say, well, you know, he was selfless. They have to see why, you know, what he did that was so selfless. And they would take uh, stickers, you know, they'd add these really nice st stickers or uh, decals uh, and put them onto the helmet. And so, you know, as the season's gone on, they, the, the helmet continues to become more and more full uh, of the players that demonstrate great character. And so I think that's a really, another really clear way to highlight and show that we value not just your performance on, on the field or on the ice or on the court. And 
he's definitely, Dorn's definitely challenged us this episode to find ways to show our love for, for our players, uh, to show them that we care about them. I, I think this has to be authentic, though. And I think the reality is Anson Dorrance is a good human being who truly loves his players, right? We can't fake it. And that so much comes down to the mindset. Are we seeing our players as people? Do we really see them that way? And um, I think that it comes naturally. Uh, so if you're looking for the strategies of like, well, this is how he does that. Like, it could be easy to say, okay, well, he does this to show his players that he loves them. And then to go to try to do that. But if it doesn't come from a place that's authentic, that we genuinely love our players, then it will fall flat. Um, love that quote of, I play some players I don't like very much. And there are some players I, I don't play that I absolutely love. I think he has brutal honesty. And, and I think he's very funny about that. You know, I mean, he talks about how some players, you know, suck or, you know, I just, I just like his authenticity as a coach. I think everyone could sense that Anson Dorrance is authentic. Um, and the cool thing too, is I was really curious cause I, you know, training soccer champions is written in 1995, 1995. Right. And he talked about working with parents in that book. And I was curious, man, like parents have gotten so much worse, right. Over the last 30 years. And I'm wondering if he still allows parents to be a part of his program. And he hasn't wavered in that. Right. Um, he talks about how they never hold the parents at an arm's length and they recognize that the reason their daughters are so good is because of the parents. And to some extent, I owe the parent. I think that's so powerful. But it also it comes back to our mission as coaches. If we truly want to impact the lives of our athletes, then we want the parent to be a part of helping us to shape the player in a positive way is what he says. I want the play- parent to be a part of me helping to shape the player in a positive way. So to do that, we have to work with them. And so they incorporate parents into so many things they do. Uh, and he's also willing to share with the parents anything they want to know. And this is college, Division One, the highest level uh, of, of you know, soccer in America. And he's willing to engage the parents. Um, and I love this, you know, the parents who handle their daughter being benched well, he always lets them know how he appreciates their support. And I think that's how often do we say thank you? Thank you for allowing me to coach your son or thank you for allowing me to coach your daughter. That's one of my biggest recommendations to coaches and uh, every time they do that, it's really funny because when coaches will say, hey, thank you for allowing me to coach your son or your daughter this season, parents are like, whoa, <laughs> they're a little bit taken back by it. Um, but it's really phenomenal uh, to see the response then is usually like, well, no, coach, thank you, right? Um, and we're obviously not doing that because we want to thank you, but it's pretty impactful. Um, we touched, uh, touched on greater expectations, you know, um, this idea of accountability. But probably one of the most best lines that he has in this episode, it's got to be, my job is to help them get to the truth as fast as possible. And this is important because without awareness, people will never take responsibility or ownership for their behaviors. So we have to have, help them f- become aware of their behavior, of their lack of character. And he tells that obviously really impactful story in the episode. Lastly, leadership development. You can't teach leadership. It has to be developed. Uh, and, and he talks about using mentors in the one-on-one to help them develop their character. And I'm excited because Anson's now currently reading the culture system. After this uh, interview, I sent it over to him and, you know, and, and I'm excited for his feedback on the leadership council because we've had so much uh, success with coaches using that to develop leaders. Uh, it's a great, great intentional way backed by a lot of research. Okay, a huge thanks to Anson for coming on the podcast. Be sure to check out his books, The Vision of a Champion, Training Soccer Champions, The Men Watching, and his podcast, The Vision of a Champion. Also, if you want training and resources for your staff in the competitive cauldron, um, if you want to learn some effective ways to determine and communicate playing time, or you want help developing leaders through a leadership council, be sure to check out our online courses the competitive cauldron, the playing time system, and the culture system, which is made up of 22 modules. One of those modules being about the leadership council system. So if you want those things, go on over to tocculture.com forward slash store. Also, Jacob will put a link in the details of this episode. Thanks again for listening to this podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or on YouTube. Also, be sure to share these episodes if you found them valuable. And leave us a review if you feel it deserves a nice five-star rating. 